Welcome to another episode of the Bastard Sermon. I'm one of your three hosts, Cody Hucker. Luke Young. Lloyd Johnson. Our fourth mic for today is... Sean Moore. And this week, we have a uh, legendary front man. He's toured the nation and the world under the band's Choking Victim, Star Fucking Hipsters, Leftover Crack, and No Commercial Value. Everyone, please give it up for Scott Sturgeon, a.k.a. Stizza Crack. Woo! Um, I think that we uh, maxed out everything. Hell yeah, <laughs> man. <laughs> Thanks for doing the um, show. I'm doing okay, yeah. I, I, I'm a front person. Not a front man. Front person. But, Righteous. Yeah. Heard you. But I, I, I can't wait to like, correct everything. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> Daddy, um, bastard sermon. Are you, is it always all four of you guys? Three there's, y'all, yeah. five of you? So there's three of us uh, right now, which is me, Lloyd, and Luke. And then uh, the friend that we have is my close friend. Me and him grew up listening to your music. Uh, I guess I was introduced right to everything that you did around... I thought it was 16, so I guess that's 12 years ago or something like that. And uh, Sean yeah. showed it to me, so I figured we should have another person in the room that really knew your music and everything that you did and would be able to ask you questions that you would enjoy. Yeah. I noticed that uh, um, when I meet people that have listened to any of my bands for, for a long time, they really like to like kind of talk about the person that got them into it or like give them credit. It's interesting because I, I don't feel like most, like I don't know, doesn't seem applicable a lot of the time when people are talking about bands. How's everything like been that. going since COVID ended? Are you guys back on tour? Are you doing things for Leftover Crack? I saw stuff about new Choking Victim albums. Can we talk about that to start? Yeah, well, we um, we played three shows in uh, in L.A., Orange County, and Las Vegas, and then uh, and then we don't have I don't have, have anything. I don't really know when the next show is going to be, except that I'm playing a, a show on ho- like two days before Halloween in Atlanta, acoustic. What's your primary band focus right now? Is it Leftover Crack, or are you going through Star Fucking Hips or stuff, or is it interchangeable? Well, I almost have a complete lineup for Star Fucking Hipsters. So the next live shows, uh, if any, are probably going to be Star Fucking Hipster shows. Nice. But that being said, I have a lot of music. Um, not just music that I wrote, but music that was recorded. Um, Alec and Donnie and me recorded, uh, and I, we recorded, um, what, like eight tracks for Leftover Crack? And we already had five, five Leftover from Constructs of the State. Const- so, there was a little bit of a delay on our end. That's the problem with doing Zoom interviews sometimes. There's a little bit of that delay. Uh, Stizza, for our listeners, is over in uh, New York right now. You're, is that where you're currently re- located? I'm in, uh, yeah, I'm, in, I'm over by the East River um, in New York City, in Manhattan. Yep. Nice. Is that still a, is, I, maybe I'm way out of date with knowing stuff about you, but I guess that's why we've got you here. Is is that like a C-Squat a thing? or is? Well, I mean, uh, um, C, this is the same building as C-Squat. It is still C-Squat technically in some ways, but uh, it's a co-op now, and uh, people own parts of it and we owe banks lots of money that we have to pay so can you talk can you speak to that a little bit what for the listeners and the people that don't have any idea what c-squad is can you speak a little bit about that well um this building has been around a long time i've heard people say that there's another c-squad and this and that this building i'm in is at 155 avenue c and uh in manhattan and this is a place I know as C Squat, and uh, I think it opened up around 1989, 90, um, and kind of operated as a as a non temporary spot. As a lot of places, a lot of cities and, and places outside of New York have squats that are very temporary, like overnight. You could say a place overnight, and then the cops come and you get kicked out. This place, kind of the, by design, whoever um, the first people that that, that uh, came here made sure to, to check the laws and uh, did what they could to become tenants on some level, even though this building was pretty fucking messed up. They got mail delivered here, and uh, if you have mail that dates back 30 days, like cops can't just straight away evict you. So uh, that was a safeguard, and uh, honestly, um, it's. It's kind of like a, 
it's surprising that, that we never got evicted, actually, because a lot of people did get evicted that had their shit together, that were a lot more political than a lot of people in this building, and had families, and uh, in the end, I think that uh, the last 11 buildings that were, that, um, that were left behind after a bunch of squads were evicted in, on, um, on East 13th Street, which had a lot of families in them, um, and we're talking about the mid nineties, I would say like 94, 95, 96. I don't really know the dates. I don't have that shit like uh, memorized or anything, but, um, what I, from what I hear, Rudy, Rudy Giuliani got such bad press from evicting the families on 13th street that he just didn't want to deal with evicting the rest of the squats. And he, he, uh, found a, a nonprofit to make a deal with and sell the buildings for cheap too. And they've been working with us ever since on some levels. Isn't C-Squat one of the only, isn't it one of the only, uh, like, long-functioning uh, squats that's actually have any, that had any, like, legal standing in the United States? Wait, so wait, what's your question? That This is one of the very few yeah. long-standing that has, like, has kind of, is safe from eviction, maybe? Yeah, what you mean? or established squatters' rights, because I know it's an extremely hard thing to establish, right? Well, you know, um, to be honest... And I, I, I think I can speak for most people that have lived in this building. Um, we don't really know what the squatter laws are completely. Um, some some people do. Uh, we kind of like were the fuck ups. We partied a lot. For some reason, we just kind of skated by and and were included in the last buildings that uh that were given you know the chance to become legal and to to be owned by by the tenants. So you know I can't I can't um. I'd love to tell you all the laws that I don't know. and like, you know. <laughs> No, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Fuck all that shit. Fuck the laws. But the fact is that I'm, I'm, I'm much better at Alameda County Law, which is Oakland. And um, I almost, I got a building there. I feel like I almost won a building from the federal, um, National Federal Mortgage, whatever. Fannie Mae is what they call them for a reason. It's confusing, but it's also, uh, they're like fucked up people. Um, anyways, the point is, it's all a mystery to us. Right. I'm sure there's kind a huge of. musical community going on throughout all of C Squad. I mean, isn't that the genesis of a bunch of the bands that you've been in is just living well, in that area and amongst that community of people? Is there like a jam area where you guys play music within C Squad? Or how do you guys actually get together and start to form these bands and get to perform together? Well, um, when I first came down to this building, uh, I was in high school in um, on the in the west the west side um, in Chelsea uh, at a uh, high school called um, the Baird Rustin High School of the Humanities and um, I would I would walk across town and come down here in uh, in the basement where I don't know if any of you have ever been to see squat no. no no none of us I don't think <laughs> no. any of us have ever been but you're aware that we've had shows forever here absolutely of. yeah. So all the shows have always been in the basement, um, which is like the basement's unique because it's uh, there's no um, the back of the very the ground floor is kind of uh, does not exist. It's just like there's a balcony and then there's just nothing. So you have a balcony overlooking the basement, which makes like a really cool um, it makes for a really cool venue space, you know. Um, and then uh, on top of that. Um, when I first came here, it was, I, I, I didn't realize until recently that this building had probably only been open for a few months. I think that it was the first year that it was open. And um, there, there were people in the basement. There's like like kind of bits of a drum set and maybe a bass amp and some some gear. And, you know, there's a bunch of people that, that I didn't know, but uh, a lot of them lived here. A lot of them lived at a squat called Glass House on Avenue D. A lot of lived in other squats on 9th Street between C and D. And um, there were really a lot of musicians here um, at that in that era. And really, um, that's where I met a lot of the people that I played music with. And uh, I don't know. It's, it's like, it's weird because we never, uh, nobody ever really planned that. It just, it just kind of happened. And, and uh, this happened to be like the kind of, the middle of the universe for the musicians in the, like a two block radius in the squats. So. What kind of debauchery does this shit turn into? I know it's got to be fucking crazy. I know you don't want to d- divulge too much, you know, wild I'll, I'll, shit. I'll tell, you know what? 
I'll tell, uh, I'll tell what I can, you know, I mean, it's not like we're going to get in trouble for some shit that happened 25 years ago, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. So, Let's yeah. get into it. But, 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 um, but like, what, what part? Like, what, Just what, anything what, that what, strikes you immediately, like something that stands out as like one of the, I don't know, the fucking craziest parties that you guys have had. Maybe there's ODs on stage. I've seen, like, you know, punk rock bands where there's a lead singer o- overdosing on on the stage and then having to be swept really? off and narcan and fuck, and uh, at What's Bogart's Tiger Sex. <laughs> Tiger Sex oh, was the name of the band. Dude, I remembered that, but I was like, what fucking where band? Where's that in was Ohio? That? Yeah, it was at Bogart's over there. And where's Bogart's at? Is Short that Vine uh, Clif- Short, Vine. Short Vine and Clifton? Yeah. Yes. You know, the, the only time I ever OD'd on Upper Vine was um, the first time I, I um, cuffed Air Duster. <laughs> I had I a friend that died up. from that. Yeah, tell that story. Fuck yeah. I'm alive, but um, yeah, I, I just was. It kind of looked a little bit like this, but this is not air duster. Funny because I just bought some at Home Depot a minute ago. <laughs> but, um, it's valuable. Um, so so uh, you literally saw a band play and their singers are being on stage. Tiger sex, yeah. She had broken ribs, and I guess she was she wasn't very uh, coherent throughout the beginning of her set. And I was excited about seeing them play totally because forgot about this. Yeah, shit. Tiger sex. This is at Bogarts too? Yeah, it was yeah. that. So Bogarts was uh, they were opening for the Casualties, and they actually closed off. This was right after the lead singer got in trouble for the sexual assault thing, and they replaced the lead singer. Oh, so funny, really. Yeah, they um they closed off half the venue because they couldn't sell tickets, I guess, since that had happened. Oh, okay. But we were like, well, there's a new singer, so the guy that's the problem's not there. So fuck it, let's go. So the opening act was Tiger Sex, and she's up there talking about how her ribs are cracked, and she's nodding like mid set, and then like out of nowhere, she like just starts falling down, and we were like, fuck, what's going on? And then she just starts like falling down in the middle of her set because she had uh. There wasn't a stage. Bogarts has a stage, but they uh, curtained off half the venue. So the stage was right, right. just the ground floor, right? So everybody could just get up there and fucking get wild in the middle of the bands. And she just started right. falling down. And when she started falling down, dudes started stomping on her, to which point we were like, what the fuck is security doing? Like, she's ODing she and she's getting stomped on. She could have been the crowd were stomping on her? The, there was one dude in particular that was, yeah. And then uh, I think that he got whisked away and beat the shit out of and then they kind of swept them off stage, and uh, I went to go take a piss because I was like, I've seen shit like this before. And I mentioned to the guy when I was taking a piss, like, uh, yeah, you're missing the the lead singer's overdosing right now. And he's like, I've seen it before. And I look over, and he's got a big tiger sex back patch on the back of his vest. And I then I connected the dots, and I was like, oh, it's probably, like, her boyfriend. Like, this is not some fucking new occurrence for him. Like, the, he's just kind of sitting there. <laughs> not even paying attention because there's a balcony section you had to go to take a piss or whatever and he's sitting up there like shaking his head like god fucking damn it and then they swept her off stage and the casualties had to start early that's wild that you remember all them details dude this was years ago and i remember like half of what you you said i mean (laughs) yeah it's an interesting story i mean it could be you know i mean um people use the word overdose like to mean a lot of things i guess so could be it could have been nervous exa- exhaustion is the one I like you to go with. Sure, I don't want to put anything she, on no, her. She's Who sleepy, knows? dude. Yeah, she was sleepy. But, she looked a little tired for that gig. It is it is interesting that um that that just talking about it kind of like has a if there's a stigma to it, you know? You know what I mean? Like uh that's interesting. It's just interesting. It's merely interesting to me. Have you had any sleepy situations on stage before that you can remember? I'm sure. I'm sure that I, uh, <laughs> I wasn't fully awake. I'm, I, I've never really gone to town like um, some members of Leftover Crack that I commissioned, but um, like I, I've never been someone that really likes to get super fucked up on on uh, on downers usually. Like um, but that being said, like we we have like three shows in a night, so like the second one was passed out. Yeah, but. Uh, I get up to sing whether it sounds good or not. You ever go for a nice robo trip on stage? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, my favorite. Um, actually, for a while, um, I was getting I was I was in Austin for a bit, and I was getting a lot of mushrooms. So I, you know, I tried I tried microdosing, as they say, and then you know I upped my dosage a little bit. <laughs> Give me all this energy, you know, like uh, and and I, I, oddly enough, it really did take away like inhibition so I, I just had fun every time i did 
mushrooms and played with leftover crack. Did and you? it's like it's very that fun with that band because like I'm not playing instrument an instrument usually and a we're in a, a club and everybody's there like to see us so it's like we're not really dealing with too many variables. There's a lot of love coming at us and it's like uh it's a comfortable place to be. You know? Yeah. Uh, maybe it's an overdone question. I'm sure you get it a lot, but how involved is smoking crack in either your current life or like in the the lives of that band? I mean, it's uh, you, you named it after leftover crack, right? Because it's the joke. There's no such yeah, thing I as leftover crack. I'd say that crack, the drug crack, probably had the out of all the drugs that you could choose that exist, um, it probably um was the le- the least used drug in our band. Oh, and interesting. That's not these ton of drugs. I'm just saying that that it's like not crack is not something that um as a singer you should probably do before you play or it's not really something to do on tour like when you have a show to, you know maybe like after a show if you want to like if you're younger and you want to like hang out all night and not go to sleep that's yeah. great but but really it really never fit into um into any of the bands like as we were writing or recording or touring so much. I mean, I've been a fan of cocaine personally in my life. I've never smoked crack, but I've had plenty of friends that have done it. I mean, uh, you hang around with a certain group of people, you're going to see them do it constantly. But I had some... It was like you were saying before about the stigma that ODing has around it, or whatever you want to call it, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Like it, it has some stigma in your head that's built up based on shit that you've been told on whatever, whatever fucking media sources or what people tell you. But it's when I actually see it, I didn't see... I'm sorry. What'd you say? We're all kind of when when we're little, we're all kind of brainwashed to believe this one thing about drugs. So it's like that's part of it too, you know. Yeah, and then you see it in person, yeah. and sure, it gets fucking wild. I'm not advocating like any type of drug use. Do whatever you feel comfortable with and whatever you know about. But it doesn't. A lot of these drugs aren't what they're all fucking uh, no uh, no pun intended cracked up to be. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh. Yeah. I mean, crack is a great example of a drug that's not cracked up to be much. So, um, you know, it's something that doesn't last very long. Uh, I don't really, I don't see it as a social drug because, uh, you know, people get all weird. They're like, oh, you need more crack, don't you? I want some of that. You know, like, there's all, like, weird fucking, like, paranoia going on where people want to, it's just not something that you bust out to, like, unite and bond to people. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> you don't really do that. You don't bring the crack out and be like, let's all be crack buddies. Actually, I had <laughs> the only time I almost smoked crack was like, there was a guy that was literally like, uh, Mike. P- that's not his real name, right? But his his internet name. Uh, he's fucking... The first time that I go into his house, my drunk-ass friend brings me over there, and he does whip out a, a fucking chicken bone and just starts wanging it immediately. And it was like, would you like some? And I was like, nah. My other friend was like, I'll uh, shotgun it to you, and it'll be better that way for whatever reason. It's I was like, not addictive like that, <laughs> Yeah, I was like, almost talked into it, but... He, he was, he was he trying to... The, the first- <laughs> he was trying to socially smoke crack with me. Like, that was the, the whole thing. And then after that, it was like some bonding experience where he's like, all right, we're going to go uh, spray paint. And I was like, all right. And then he walks one house over from where he lives and starts fucking <laughs> spray painting the, the fence for his next door neighbor with, like, train hot. He's like a an oogle kid that's, like, riding trains and shit. So he's fucking spray painting all over the thing and shit like that, like smoking crack in the middle of the street. And I was like, it was the only time that I've ever seen crack be like a, you know, a friendship experience. Wait, hey, this party's I dull. Mean, Let's bring out some crack. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anything can be a friendship experience, I suppose. But, uh, you know, people that have, that, like, uh, that have been smoking crack for years probably aren't like, you know. It's not something for them. What, what is it? Neighbor? Mother? Daughter. Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You had a name for that. Kind of, you did the punch like uh, grandma. <laughs> oh, I, I said it's not yeah. some thing for them. Like it's not like a uh, it's some big deal that they're smoking crack. Your grandma must be way different than mine. <laughs> I was gonna say the closest I think I've ever come to wanting to smoke crack was when I was around family. So yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> let's go into family. Can we go into your family? Like, what is the? I mean, you don't. You don't form a Scott Sturgeon stiz a crack without some basis that makes you want to fucking 
you know, ride trains and form these bands and lash out against society, right? What was your upbringing like? Um, I, my upbringing was, was, uh, was probably pretty boring to most people, but, um, but my mom's Jewish, and so I was Jewish too, and I went to Sunday school and had a bar mitzvah, and she's really over, over, for someone that's so overprotective, bringing up two, uh, two children in, in the, the center of, of New York City is not, it's, it's not advisable, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't seem like an easy road to walk there. That's... No, not at all. And then I had read online that you had a stepfather that had committed suicide or whatever. Did that play any? Yeah, yeah well, um, you know, I, it, it did, I think, but uh, it's hard to say because he wasn't really that friendly with us and he wasn't involved in our our lives except to, like, point out our mistakes, really. But, uh, um, but in, like, you know, over time I've realized, like, that I've gotten the most personality traits from this person that I barely knew, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's weird because I I, I I feel like I probably, in, in my own way, know know him more than anybody else in my family, but I just, but that's easy to say when you don't really get to know people, so I don't know. Is it just through the, the bonding experience of, like, understanding that level of depression where you just have to take yourself out? Yeah, I mean, and, and it's... Uh, it's in spite of a person that really didn't make very much effort to be friendly with me or my brother. Um, and throughout all that stuff, I feel like I never spent any time with this person, but then I feel like that I just got all these weird character, you know, character traits and like, um, musical influences. And, uh, I don't know. Was he a musician? What did he play? He was a drummer. Did you start off as, as a drummer? How many in- different instruments do you play? I mean, I I can play like, um, like the whole band's instruments very poorly. <laughs> I record. <laughs> There's recordings of it on, on a couple of things. I don't know why we released it. It was a bad idea, but uh, you can just hear just how bad I am on some of these things. You have a um, great live recording of One Dead Cop that I fucking love. Where you're doing the that's where I learned to play it on guitar. Is I can't sing for shit, but. Like well, acoustic or what? Yeah, it was an acoustic live set where you were. It looked like you were by yourself. It was a black and white video. I this is years ago that I listened to it. So I, dude, I don't fucking remember. Like I'm fucked. I don't know drinking and doing drugs. I don't remember a lot of shit. I'm sure I'm we're sure, in the same boat. I, yeah, I bet it was in England. <laughs> the thing. It's it's when you had the rat tail and the the hat that said lice on it. The were you, the police or whatever it was. The PO was uh, carved oh, yeah, out yeah. for lice. And you were playing One Dead Cop on acoustic. I think you were by yourself. I don't think there was anybody else in the band. You were just doing solo sets for that. Right, right. No, but I mean, I was playing for, like, you know, five people. Yeah. And then I was, but, but I wasn't accompanied by anybody else. Yeah, I don't know. Um, people seem to like some of that stuff. Uh, the um, I, I My problem with all that acoustic stuff that I play by myself is, uh, first of all, I'm not, I'm not a great instrumentalist or singer. Um, and also all the songs that I'm playing usually have like three different guitar things happening that, that make, that's what I think makes those songs good is, uh, when you have the harmonies that, that, uh, you know, that, that I cannot do playing by myself acoustic at all. Um, also I noticed, uh, not that long ago that, um, everybody else in a, in a punk band that was, that actually put themselves out there to play acoustic by themselves at a show were really good like good guitar players good singers and uh you know i don't know what my problem is yeah i just saw you at days and days uh two years ago i was uh i was wondering uh what your keyboard influences are because you don't see a lot of keyboard in punk music wait i'm um, saying that keep away what i saw you a couple years ago with days and days up at um yeah. what is that mad cats yeah mad cats, at mad cats. He was asking about your keyboard influences, yeah. though, because you don't see a lot of it in punk music. So yeah, you're he was playing a uh, keyboard half the time, and I was like, "You don't hear a lot of that in punk." Do you? Do you have certain yeah, influences, mean, or? Well, um, I, the thing about me is that I uh, I like all types of music. I um, 
I think that it's not it's not the best idea to start a punk band with a bunch of people that only listen to punk music because I agree. I think the second you'll notice like the second generation punk bands that were only influenced by other punk bands are like ten there's still really great ones out there, but mostly they tend to not be as interesting or as good. Um and that's why I think punk was exciting in the first place is because all these bands kind of started like in their own vacuums, you know, or their own, um, their own kind of like influences. None of them were like influenced by each other. Just that wasn't like a big thing for early punk. It was, uh, although there was like a couple bands that probably did like Sex Pistols and, uh, and the Ramones, but beyond that, everybody listened to everything. And, and you have like bands that definitely aren't punk, like, uh, like, uh, the Minutemen playing okay. punk shows. And then you have, uh, and you just have all these different eclectic kind of things going on. I think it shows through in your music pretty well because my first introduction to like really enjoying punk music was listening to Choking Victim. Because I, not that I didn't appreciate it before that, I was just like a dumb 15 year old metal kid that was just like fucking Slayer and nothing else. And if it isn't fucking Cannibal Corpse and fucking black metal from Norway, I don't give a shit about it. And then <laughs> I got introduced to fucking Choking Victim. And then, like, as you explore, it's like, I like this. And then as you explore that music and you find out about, you know, Leftover Cracks, Starfuck Hamsters, NDK, all that, I could go on and on forever about everything that's connected throughout it you start also digging into what the influences are and then you find wu-tang clan which is where the basis for your name comes from and then boots riley i found out about you through that nardwar interview where you were uh talking with brad logan because uh, brad plays guitar and leftover crack and f minus and he was doing that interview with you in canada right and uh you were talking about working with boots riley and how he was like a super influential artist for you and i was like i've I was like, I fucking, I grew up loving this dude's music. All right, if this is what influenced him, let me check out the coup. And then I checked him out, and I was like, these guys fucking rule. And then it was like, what's nine eleven till to infinity? And I was like, this is fucking dope. And then you're like, you're doing a hip hop section on that on that fucking track. It was like, it was fucking awesome. Like it really shows through all the different influences that come through in punk music. And when you really get into that subculture and you really enjoy it, it like it breeds like people that want to explore it even more so yeah fucking. I, mean, I, I try to i try to kind of treat our recordings especially and our shows I, I like to be inclusive but i also like to um i like to do that thing where it's like i like it to be a community thing you know like um there's nothing more fun for me when i especially when i was younger was to like read the liner notes of, of different you know like especially like comps like look at record comps were my favorite um going through it and seeing who produced what song and who did for it and who's in what band and then like finding all this other stuff just through your own research is really cool it's like a fun thing to do and it's it's rewarding you know what i'm saying and uh right absolutely i like to, i like to give more like um to have more like stuff like not i don't want to be like a closed kind of a lot of bands are like we're this band we're important that's a, that's another problem everybody thinks they're important but you know, besides that, it's like I think people should have sense of humor, and I think that people should try to share, you know, their creative process with other people and share their music with as many people as possible. Too, you know, and that shows through in your music and everything that you do. I mean, you're not just like uh, I, I I know all that about you without even hearing you say it, and that speaks a lot to what you do. I think. I mean, it really <laughs> comes through in your music, and I think that's why so many people identify with it. Which kind of leads me to another question I want to ask you. Is it, it's got to be surreal for you just being some dude, like just doing what you want to do and playing music and, you know, but being like admired by people across the world and like seeing your shit blow up, like have millions of views on YouTube and Spotify and seeing all this, like what kind of impact do you feel like that's had on your life? I mean, that's all just really positive stuff that really, um, like, if I'm I, 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 as a person that suffers from de depression, often um, it's always nice to to you know read something like positive that someone writes about um, my influence on them or something or um, just all that all that like uh, you know I don't know I, I, it's it's hard to explain but it's like uh, the reason why I play music 
Well, I mean, the probably the, the the least reason why I play music is money. Uh, you know, out of every reason there could be, that's like the one that's at the bottom of the list. And um, I just want to, you know, uh, you know, and and there's a hope for political bands that they could maybe make a difference by influencing other people to think a certain way. But uh, I like to influence people to think for themselves, which is uh, it hasn't always worked out for me <laughs> when I have like you know. I don't really have a platform or an agenda that that uh, that people can back fully, but um, but I think that it's good for everybody to have more free thinkers. Absolutely. How 100%. do you feel like? How do you feel like your uh, political views have changed over the years of doing these bands? Have they changed? Like, do you disagree with your old self and your music and things that you've written, or do you double down it, on? The only stuff, like I, almost everything I've written. I still agree with and in fact it's like more so than ever but um the only stuff that I regret is uh is like skits between like putting like Prince Paul style skits before a song or like uh just some of my like uh, my language and like like being I was just like kind of when I was younger I was I was like kind of a jerk that's the only way I describe it and uh I regret that being like that um a lot of it was just kind of having a vision for a song and having to like explain it to people that have visions for their own songs too. And it's like, but this is my song. And, um, <laughs> you know, that attractive, but it's like, it, it, um, I don't regret fighting for that stuff, but, um, I, I'm sure that there's a better way to do it than I've ever done. You know, I just haven't, I don't know what really the an alternative. So, do you think that it, is the fight still inside of you the way that it was in your younger self? Like, are you still fighting for the same things, or are you just making music for yourself at this point? Oh, I mean, I'm still like very much, uh, um, I'm still very much angry about the same things, and and um, and I'm still very like, uh, like the, the my, my main points that I, I return to, you know, more than once in my bands. Um, for instance, like police brutality and um, and corruption and like uh, just like the corruption of power and money and and greed um, and there's, there's there's like dozens there's like a dozen others that I'm that I'm not gonna like sure uh, recite but it's like um all that stuff is a uh, a lot of it there's been leaps and bounds in understanding each other and and whatnot but um at the same time it's hard for me to disregard or ignore when like, uh, you know, someone's being racist or, or a police officers being racist, you know, like, and you live in New York. So you're seeing all this shit that a lot of these people you're singing, you're singing to all these fans. They don't even see a lot of this shit. You got fans probably in the suburbs, angry at the world and shit that don't truly see That's half this world. shit in real life. You think people, People in the suburbs don't see corrupt police. Not as much as you not, would see in the, not in the our streets. Suburbs. Not as much as you yeah. would see in probably the streets of New York. I don't think that there's as much. Yeah, I, I, I would think that, and I feel like the, the, the few times I've been, you know, not few, but like, you know, many times I've been outside of cities and just anywhere. And and uh, it's a lot more noticeable to me when cops pull someone over um, and, uh, you know, no matter where you are in in America, at least, um, the the chances that the the person that the police have pulled over is not a white person is very strong. Yeah. And uh, and and you know, I think that as a matter of fact, I feel like I ha I've seen less less some police corruption and racism and all that in in the cities, and a lot more of it just right outside the cities. You know, like. The, the, the rich part of town or something or whatever, you know, not necessarily in New York, but like everywhere, you know? Yeah. Yeah. By far the most like, uh, fucked up situation I've ever been in with police was in, you know, a more rich, er you know, area. I was, <clears throat> I was basically told by a cop, by the way I look, I might as well be black. And it sounds so that. carnish because it sounds so cartoonishly like fake. What the fuck? But it's almost hard to tell the story. Cause I'm like, you're not going to believe like this guy just said that to me openly with no like as if i was going to agree with him right 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 <clears throat> and i'm I up, mean, like yeah you know, where i mean at that point i mean what, what people what is very important for everybody in in like 
to, to realize and what I think people fail to see time and again is that um, the police are not inherently racist. They are inherently against poor people. They're there to protect wealth and power and um, and people are secondary, you know what I'm saying? And um, there's all this like, you know, back and forth and, and like people get sidetracked so easily talking about race, but it's um, really not a race issue. It's a, uh, it's a class issue. And um, there's plenty of white people that have no money that, you know, the cops are pulling over and saying, like, you might as well be black or whatever, you know. I'm probably saying much worse than that, you know. Um, and uh, it's just, the problem is that that's what the police are built for. Like, you can change their training all you want, but their job is to is to protect property and, and, and people that own like uh, you know, a disproportionate amount of it. I think so. Um, I don't yeah, know. I've always. I'm, saying, like, I'm sorry. Yeah. Continue. I'm sorry. I was gonna say I don't have any solutions for for the police problem except for a stated in one day cop. I think I had a good solution, but people don't really point that out. But um, as it's like a positive song with like instructions and stuff. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but 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 um, yeah, I really don't know what the fuck. You know, I like I will point out problems all day long and and that's all great except you know then i'm like all right show's over and then there's no solutions right i've always run away from the club (laughs) i think that the admirable thing about you though has always been that on uh as much as you preach about it a lot of people talk all day and night there was an interview that i mean me and sean when we were kids growing up we'd always uh we do some shitty impression of you or whatever because there was an old video that went around YouTube where you did some quick uh, the days of 2008 fucking flip phone cameras like hey what's going on with Stiz of Cracks here and you've got a cast on your arm and it was like what's up what's up with the cast on your arm and it was like I just punched a cop in Dallas Texas and it was like or wherever it was I don't know if it was Dallas I'm probably getting the names wrong but I remember it distinctly and it was like holy shit, like, he's not just, like, singing songs about fuck the police, like, he's punching people in the fucking face about it, like, I don't know that that's his solution, and I'm not saying that's his solution, but god damn it if you didn't, like, actually fucking live what you're talking about, you're not full of shit about it. I've heard that I've punched cops a couple times in my life, um, I was probably pretty wasted, um, and, uh, I only, my, my one rule is only punch a cop if you can get away with it. It seemed like you got away with it, because I feel like if you punched the cop to the point to where your fucking hand's broken, and you're doing another interview about it on the internet at that time, you got away with it, so everything was fine. Also, it's likely I was lying, also, by the way. How, no, uh, I'm just <laughs> I get it, dude. I, will you give me some ice, too? I'm sorry, I, I, Luke. No, but, um, I did, I, I, I don't know, that era of our band when I'm breaking my hand and shit is, uh, you know, there's not a lot of, of, uh, what do you call it when people um, have like uh, accountability? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that stuff, accountability, you know, there's not a lot of that. Oh, fuck so. all that accountability shit. Who needs that? <laughs> How will we ever grow as human beings and shit like that? Uh, right? I, I, so, so supposedly we'll all grow as human beings as the day we're all accountable for everything we've ever done, but um, I just don't see it. I don't see that. Yeah, I just get more depressed about what a piece of shit I am constantly. I'm just like, God, I'm a fucking loser. It makes me want to sleep in longer. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's what I, I sleep a lot. That's what I did last year. I slept all the time. I was curious about it. I saw some interview that you did with uh, a lady. I wish that I could plug her and I knew the name, but uh, I tried to listen to some of the interviews that he had done within the last two years so that I wasn't repeating the same questions over and over, but she had asked you about it, and you had mentioned something about insomnia, because I wanted to go into mental health with you, because I feel like it plays okay. in directly to what you do. Uh, oh, like but, but, By the way, I'm glad that you don't remember the, the name of the interviewer, because uh, I probably don't either, and then... <laughs> it'll be real awkward for her. Your problem is not mine. <laughs> yeah, it'll be like, it'll be like in uh, one day when somebody's like, what podcast did you just do? And you're like, the bastard? I don't know. Some idiots from bastard. Cincinnati. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. The We're going to cut that sermon. and use that for the intro now. Stiz the Crack said the Bastard Sermon. <laughs> the Bastard Sermon. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Yeah. And these guys. <laughs> can you talk I'm to... I'm going to name you guys. 
Kyle, Jeff, Jeff, Kyle, Dave. And I'm Dave. Dave. I'm Kyle. I'm Dave. Yeah, that's me. And Lloyd. Is, are you yeah. Dave? No. No. <laughs> I knew there wasn't any Dave's. I'm no. Dave now. Jeff, Jeff, Kyle, Kyle, and Dave. I mean, yeah. Usually everyone remembers Lloyd because I see a giant white guy named Lloyd and they're like, what? <laughs> the best part is that Stizzy, or I keep calling you Stizzy. You go by Scott now, right? You don't even go by Stizzy, do you? Well, my mom calls me Scott. All right, all right. Well, I see it on your Instagram, but you can't even see Lloyd. He's a gigantic man, big six foot five oh, yeah. fuck I, that's hanging out. I see it. You can I see the top see, of his uh, head. Like a bun, a man bun. Yep. <laughs> That's him. The listeners will be able to see Lloyd oh, just no, fine. Oh, now it's empty. <laughs> now it's just, oh, there you go. We have a, yeah, all right. There he is. You know what? I wouldn't guess that, that that's what you look like from the top of your head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Kind of like maybe like a hippie kind of. You, know? <laughs> you see the man bun and yeah, then you I'm, judge I'm, the rest from the top. I'm now. I was, I was picturing like. Picturing like the um, the redhead from Workaholics. <laughs> <laughs> you know? This is our this is our in house redhead right, right here. But yeah, this is no, our I'm house. Not, this I'm, is our house ginger right I'm here. I'm like the old school hardcore kid. Like we all yeah. let our hair be long forever, and now we're tired of fucking dealing with it, so we put it in man buns. <laughs> like we've all gotten you, yeah. we've all gotten old and shit. Like you know, what I mean, yeah. at coalesce concerts or whatever, it'd be down and fucking flopping everywhere. Now it's like, no, I'm gonna put this shit up, and get out of the way. Like, <laughs> Do you at least age dive like at a show you really like? Say it again. Do you at least stage dive at a show that you really like? His femur's <laughs> oh, broke right now. Well, no, I mean back in the day I didn't just because I was <clears throat> I'm six and a half foot tall, two hundred seventy pounds, and yeah. it didn't really go over well with the crowd when you dove into them. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. crowd killing. <laughs> he was he was the I guy was, throwing people to crowd surf. Yeah, I was more I was more the guy starting the pit and then like backing up and making the perimeter to watch it unfold. I was yeah. a little too big for the stage diving thing. So I, I, I then I did uh, I did. I did stage dive at a Nothing Face show because uh, they pulled me up on stage and then told me to, and I was like, "All right, well, cool," and uh, it didn't go Wait, great. What show? Uh, nothing Face. Nothing Face. Can't picture them. <clears throat> yeah, they're. Uh... <laughs> it's a joke, but it's also real. I don't. I don't know what they're like. But okay, go. Nothing Face is. A, and, all right, go ahead. Yeah, I thought he was going for a joke. No, nothing no. Face can't picture them. Yeah, Come I mean, on. that's perfect. But also, but it's... they don't ring a bell. But that was like, that was recently or no? That was or? Uh, probably over a little over a decade ago. All right. Lloyd's the older one at, out of us. I was at I was I worked at this club in New York City called Wetlands, and we'd have um. It was like kind of like a, a activist hippie club, but then also there'd be hip hop, black metal, hardcore punk, like kind of was very eclectic. It was like it was like CBGBs, but way more eclectic and non non profit. Um, and I remember there was a hardcore show happening, and I was just bar backing, and uh, but I had to go through the pit to get to the bar, and this guy probably your size, and uh, he he was doing the backwards windmill, and he hit me right on the top of the head, so hard that um, I couldn't feel my hands for like two minutes. <laughs> oh my god! And, like standing by the bar, like I was like, yeah, hey, man. I hope my spinal cord heals. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it did. It came back. But I was like, I was, sh- I was shaking. Oh my Flying god! you like a cartoon no, character, sorry. like Donkey Kong, just hit you on the top of the head <laughs> as you go through the floorboards three inches. He says that, and I immediately yeah. flashed to having spinal surgery a few times. <laughs> <laughs> oh that, shit! I would suck, but you know, it's not out of the question. You know, it could happen. Absolutely. Um, Hey, before we proceed, uh, we're coming up on the, the the first half of our free show. Do you have about another hour in you? Could you hang I for another? Can I smoke these three but- cigarette butts in the hall real quick? and then Absolutely. And Bef- we- before you do that, do you have anything you want to plug? We're going to do our plugs real quick, and then we can take a quick break, and we'll jump back into our Patreon. If I want to do what? Pull what? Do, do you want to plug anything? Any dates that are uh, upcoming? Uh, the book, perhaps? Anything that people could find you at? Um... Hmm. You know, I know there's a good answer to this somewhere, but I don't really have. Any, I don't have a new product to sell right now. Um, I think hopefully stuff like Amsters will be on tour by like January, February. So come see us if you want to support all of my bands because supporting one of them is supporting them all. 
Hell yeah, man. Oh, yeah. If anybody wants to follow him, it's Crack Daddy Kane on Instagram. Find it. Just look up Stizzy Crack. You'll find him. Type it into Google. And You'll If you're Daddy listening Daddy to the podcast... Daddy. Sorry, what? Paintings. Oh, I saw paintings too, but I haven't been selling them lately, so... Okay. Uh, let's definitely get into that on the Patreon. We're going to do our plugs real quick and do all of our ad reads, and then we'll take a quick break, and we'll be right back. If you guys want to hear the rest of the Stizza interview, it'll be on patreon.com slash the bastard sermon. $5 unlocks all of our 40-plus uh, hours of content. It's $5 a month to get all that. Uh, Huckers Fuckers, which is my side podcast that I do. We just did an interview with Allison. It was a great just hang with somebody that's working a normal job and uh, hanging out. She was cool people to talk to. We do uh, Bastard LLC, which is our movie review podcast, if you want to check that out. Every week there's a new bonus episode that you can listen to on top of the free one. And uh, there's like 40-plus hours of content going back uh, throughout the whole thing. So go and check that out if you want to hear the rest of the Stizza interview. It's over on Patreon. This episode, as all episodes, is sponsored by the amazing, the talented, the incredible Incredible, the long dick wizard, Anthony Tank Mansfield. If you want to go and check out his shit, it's neiltonoone.com or at neiltonoone on Instagram. Go and buy his amazing line of glassware, t-shirts, and enamel pens. He's a great dude. He also does a podcast about hobbies and things that people are into called What You Into. I just featured on a Quentin Tarantino episode. Please go and fucking check that out. Luke? We are also sponsored by Scarlet Vape and Smoke Shop. They have the greatest, the, the, the best, top of the line, heady glassware when it comes to smoking. If you need a new bong, water pipe, or steamroller, anything, maybe a vaporizer, maybe you need some Delta 8, Scarlet Vape and Smoke Shop has your back. And they can give you a sweet discount of 15% if you let them know you're a bastard. And they have two shops, and you can find one of them at 937 Monmouth Street, Newport, Kentucky, 41071. And the other one is at, um, He'll God find damn it. it. <laughs> It'll be there. Uh, 11424 Montgomery Road, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45249. It's a great shop. Go and check it out. A, qu- a couple quick shout-outs just to our friends, not paid sponsors, just people that we love. Go and buy tickets to Only the Late Show now. Blake Hammond is doing a taping for his comedy special. It's going to be on Amazon soon. Blake Hammond will be down at Motor for the 9 p.m. show. If you want to hang out with the bastards, me, Luke, and Lloyd will be down there supporting him. The The 7 p.m. show sold the fuck out. Sorry you missed your chance, fuck faces. But buy the Late Show tickets. You might get to be there for the actual taping of his comedy special that's going to be on Amazon. That dude's going to pop. He's going to be something. Yeah. Be a part of that. Support your local fucking people. Lee Kimbrell that just came on does uh, open mics over at the Hub. And Go Bananas Comedy Club, which he books, just opened back up. Go over there and make sure and check out some of the fucking live comedy that's happening. Live comedy's coming back to Cincinnati. There's not just a, a, a couple open mics at certain bars, but now there's the the world-famous fucking comedy club, Go Bananas, that everybody loves. Every nationally touring comedian that enjoys fucking getting out there and talking shit and telling jokes loves that comedy club please go out there and support them all city podcast with danny gamble if you don't know danny he's always painting murals throughout the city of cincinnati chicago he's in new york he's in la he's all across the fucking the nation i don't know the world but probably and he's putting up dope fucking murals and he has a great podcast called all city that you can check out where he's he just has like master classes for free with artists where if you're an artist or you're art inclined and you enjoy like some street culture of like graffiti writing. You'll really enjoy that type of podcast. I really want you guys to go and fucking check him out and support him. Uh, hopefully he, I'll be doing a, a episode of his show. If not in December, he'll be back on the podcast. Uh, anybody else, anybody that you guys can think of that you want to plug? Oh, I'm sorry. This episode is also sponsored by fuck, fuck you. you. We, we like, like the bangles. That's a uh, Lloyd Johnson from our very own bastard sermon and Alex Schubert, a comedian from Cincinnati that does a football roast joke podcast. Every week they watch the football, which I have, n- I know nothing about except for that. The Bengals are crushing it this year. I watched the game for the first time in years and fucking loved it. Cause the Bengals are actually winning. I'm sure they've got a lot of great shit to talk about. This is the season to tune in for sure. If not any other, they've got fucking great jokes. They're great people to, hang with go and add them to your regular roster of podcasts that you listen to at work or whatever the fuck you're doing stizza thank you so much for doing the free show we're going to come back after a quick break again it's uh patreon i thought you're talking about the bangles the band from the 80s 
<laughs> there has been a lot of references to them on the podcast. <laughs> We'll be back with Stizza. If you guys want to check it out, uh, $5 on Patreon. It doesn't just get you the Stizza interview. There is a fuckload of content. We're not trying to rob you. We put out like two to three podcasts a week. There's plenty of shit for you guys to listen to. There's so much. I promise you. It's very worth it. If not, though, thank you for just listening to the free show. I appreciate every single human being that listens to this podcast. All right. Thank you. We'll be back. Peace.